Cool. Um, yeah, so probably we can slowly start. Um, and I will start probably with the introduction of uh, Levagon Tokyo Coding Bootcamps, who are organizing this workshop. Uh, for those of you uh, who don't know, my name is Sasha. I am in charge of events and community and partnerships at Levagon Tokyo. And I just give me a couple of seconds. I would like to share my screen. Cool. I think everyone can see it right now. Um, so what is a Levagon Tokyo? Um, it's a global coding bootcamp. In other words, it's a programming school. And what we do here, we teach people how to code, how to build web applications from scratch during our web development boot camps, and also how to use, analyze, and manipulate data during our data science boot camps. We do it in two formats: uh, the full-time uh, programming boot camp, nine weeks, starting from Monday to Friday, a uh, whole day. And for those who have some work, part-time, oh, sorry, or family commitments, we offer twenty-four week part-time option starting after uh, work and on Saturdays. This is a bootcamp that I'm personally going through right now as well, juggling both my work at Levagon and studies as well. Um, cool, and um, yeah, a bit about the Levagon in general. We started six years ago uh, in Paris, France, and since that time we quickly spread out the world. Right now we have campuses in 43 cities around the world. And over 11,000 people graduate from our web development and data science boot camps. Um, also, what we really proud the fact that um, 160 startups had been launched by Levagon alumni during and after the boot camp. Cool. Um, this is what I said. Uh, and about our campus in Japan, we are based in Tokyo, 10 minutes walk from Meguro Station, in the co-working space called Impact Hub Tokyo. Uh, if you guys are interested, you can always drop by the place, uh, but please send me a message if you want to do it and definitely wear a mask. Um, so we started four years ago. Um, Sylvain Pierre is a founder who founded Le Wagon. And since that time we had uh, 23 batches, the batch name of the group that we call. Also, we have 300 alumni uh, in Tokyo. Um, aside from that, it's not from the running the boot camps. We also run a dynamic tech community events like today uh, we are often inviting amazing uh, speakers from the tech and startup industry like Miho and Vei to share their knowledge and to uh, help uh, our community uh, grow uh, strong and smart cool uh, that's a question that we often get what kind of students usually what kind of people usually we get for Levagon as students um, a lot different industries designers students a lot of English teachers and recruiters and that's where I come to the slide, um, not here, not here, here, why today's event is so relevant for Levagon community as well, because the majority of Levagon graduates become engineers. Um, a lot of them become uh, front-end, web, back-end, full-stack developers, and that's why today's topic is super, super relevant and important for us as well. Um, some of them also become product managers, uh, those who want to juggle both uh, business and tech skills. And some of them um, who want to dive into entrepreneurship, become entrepreneur, and then become freelancers as well. And this is probably the last slide about the next intakes. If you have any questions about the boot camps, community, or if you want to uh, you know, maybe drop by the campus one day, feel free to send me a message. Cool, and this has been everything from my side. Right now, I'm giving a microphone to our amazing speaker, Miho. Um, Miho, please uh, go on stage, introduce yourself, and feel free to start your presentation. Great, thank you for the introduction. <laughs> Sorry, introduction, Sasha. And also, thank you for organizing, Sasha, and also the Wagon team. And thank you, everybody, for joining uh, today's event. I'm Miho from a Startup Welcome Service governed by Shibuya City Office. Let me share my screen. Oh, Miho, I think that your sound is a bit low. If you could probably get closer to the screen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yep, thank you. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen and start my presentation. Yeah, if anybody like it's hard to listen, please let me know. So today's uh, event is about visa options for engineers in Japan. And I usually help uh, startup founders trying to start a business in Shibuya now with Shibuya government. 
and today's topic is engineers. So today's the day for engineers who want to start a business, also who want to work as engineers in Japan. And I'm going to talk about very not fun visa stuff, technical stuff. <laughs> so uh, please look forward to the uh, information from Wei Sam. Yeah. After me, like he's going to talk about his practical experience as a tech founder. So I'm going to talk about visa quickly. So I'm expecting today's uh, listeners will be categorized under these three sections. So first, CEO, startup founders, and the second one is freelancers, and the third one is employees. So as a CEO, startup founders, we have to know that how to sponsor a visa for our staff and also which document to provide to support them. Also, we need to provide some financial information to um, support visa. So I'm going to talk about what we have to provide as the CEO of the company. For freelancers, uh, we have to know that how to stay in Japan as a freelancer. And also freelancers also need visa help to stay here. So whom to ask for help? Also, it's important to file tax in Japan every year, especially if we are a freelancer. So let's talk about that. And if you're generating a lot of revenue, then it's okay to transition to a startup. So let's talk about the, that option as well. For employees, uh, we should know how to secure our residential status in Japan. Okay, so there are mainly three ways to work as an engineer in Japan. The first is getting employed from a big IT corporation. And the second one is working with startups or working for startups. The third one is freelancing with multiple projects by getting a lot of control from different kinds of organizations. And usually, um, if, it's, if this is uh, option one, usually the visa period is either one year, three years, five years. It's not completely guaranteed, but it's often like according to the like application that I helped or supported. Most of the uh, people getting a lot of salary from a big IT corporation can easily get three years or five years. So it's nice to secure the visa status to stay in Japan longer. And the second one, working with startups. Since startup is very young and um, startup doesn't have much financial record to show to the government. So most of the employees or staff under Work, working under startups get usually one year. And if we are freelancing with multiple projects, it depends. But I think, I assume uh, many of them might get one year, but it's all depending on our tax filing record and how much social insurance we paid in the past. Also what kind of status we were in the past. So we cannot say this is the like 100% correct because that too much depending on the status, but I would say this is the like benchmark to think about your visa plan for the next few years. So I'm gonna talk about the application process for CEO and startup founders first, but uh, please know that even if you're working as a freelancer or even if you're working as an employee in the company, please listen to this presentation because most of the CEO or startup founders don't know what to do with immigration process, even for Japanese people. Um, so also like they're always so busy with all the works. So maybe after listening to this talk as an employee or staff, you can teach them what they need and what they can provide for you. So first of all, uh, it's nice to have all the Japanese documents because Immigration Bureau can process the documents faster if it's all in Japanese. And usually applications are categorized under the three sections. First, certificate of eligibility for those who need to come to Japan from abroad. Or even if you're staying in Japan, if you don't have any residence card, then you will need to apply for a certificate of eligibility. If you are, for example, working as a student, sorry, stud studying as a student right now, you can change the status when you need to work as an engineer. Or if you already have the engineer visa, you can renew that visa. And 
the important note is if you change the organization that you work for, you have to notify Immigration Bureau that you changed the organization. So I pasted all the URL here. So um, I'm sure you can, like I can distribute these uh, materials to you after this presentation. So please click the link and get access to the official documents that you need. And company usually needs to prepare two applications at least on the like red text one. So basically we have to provide the company numbers, the name of the company and how much sales we generated last year according to the financial statement and also how much capital we put. So we need to provide this kind of financial information as well as, as, well as uh, financial documents from the last year. Basically, we need to provide withholding tax payment record from the last year. And also sometimes we need to provide financial statement if we're like still young company. Applicants usually need to provide these like two documents under the blue text and also diploma or like CV that prove what they have done in the past. Under the immigration law, category matters. And there are four categories to decide how many years you can possibly stay here. The category one is usually uh, publicly listed companies. And if it's famous company, usually it's category one. If it's category two, is the company is paying over 10 million yen uh, withholding tax every year. I'm gonna talk about the detail about uh, withholding tax later. Category three is the companies with financial record plus tax payment record. So if you, we are all operating a business for over a year, we are usually category three. But category three doesn't pay uh, over 10 million Japanese yen withholding tax last year. Category four is the usually startups without any financial record. So if we are startups, we are all category four. And withholding tax, is tricky and there are mainly two types of working style the first is contractor the second is employee and if we are paying the fee to contractor for example like if the engineers are getting project from our company we have to pay the like fee to the contractor and if the fee is less than 1 million japanese yen then the withholding tax rate is 10.21% and if it's contractor, but uh, getting over 1 million Japanese yen fee, then the withholding tax rate is going to be 20.24% for the amount exceeding 1 million yen. So I put some examples on the right side. So please look at this. And if it's employee, the withholding tax rate is all based on the withholding calculation sheet uh, provided by national tax agency. So if the monthly salary is, for example, 200,000 yen, the withholding tax amount is 4,770 yen. I put the link to the sheet so you can take a look at all the uh, numbers there. And as a CEO and startup founders, we have to think about categories a lot. And if we are category one or two, it's pretty easy, pretty like uh, smooth to get the visa. And basically, uh, if we are category one, we have to prove whether we are really category one. And also the good thing is usually category one company holds a lot of uh, employees. So I'm sure you can get a visa support from the ATL department, which makes everything easier for you. If it's category two, it's also easy. Uh, category two companies needs to provide withholding tax payment record. But aside from that, uh, it's pretty uh, easy. But if we are category three and four, it's very complicated. So we have to provide, for example, employment certificate and also company registry, business plan, and several documents that we provide to the tax office. So. Yeah, basically, if you we need about 10 types of documents to sponsor a visa under 
our company if our company is categorized under three or four. But there is a good news for all of us. So since last year, Immigration Bureau started online system to process the immigration uh, procedures on, online. And we have to submit paper to start using this online system, but still it's good because we don't have to visit uh, Immigration Bureau as long as our companies are approved by Immigration Bureau to start using this online system. So which is great. So what's usually required are the documents that we provide to the Immigration Bureau whenever we need to sponsor the visa. Also, uh, we have to assign one of the person in the company to actually do this process online. So for example, if I'm the one um, taking care of all the documents for immigration, I have to submit my ID and also my personal like, information, as well as my certificate of employment if I'm the employee of the company. And yeah, but I think they will approve the documents within a month as long as we submit everything correctly. And what happens after that is great. So we don't need to visit Immigration Bureau and we submit all the information online. And after Immigration Bureau see all the information, if they need more documents, they will contact us and we have to submit everything by, by mail. But um, as long as we submit everything properly, they just say, oh, we approve these applicants on online. So we got the email from them. And then um, after that, the applicants have to send their current residence card to the Immigration Bureau. Then after Immigration Bureau receives the current residence card, then they uh, send the new residence card to the company directly. So what the applicants needs to do is they basically need to pick up the residence card at the company. So nobody needs to visit the Immigration Bureau. So if you're hiring a lot of um, international people who needs visa sponsorship, please think about applying for this online system. So I am going to move to the freelancers. If there is no question, I'm gonna just proceed. I am going to proceed, okay. So for freelancers, um, there are mainly three types of freelancers, I think. The first one is A, the pure freelancers who often get independent contract, contract from the companies. And the second one is solo proprietor in Japanese called kojin jigyonushi. And the third category of freelancers are those starting a startup, I think. So I am going to talk about the first pure freelancers. And as I mentioned, we have to file tax every single year, especially if we are working as a freelancers. And the tax filing is called kakute shinkoku in Japanese. And we have to file it between February 15th to March 15th every year. And tax accountants can also help. And usually I think they charge about 50, 5,000 yen for the process. So, but it's easy. So like you can do it by yourself. Also, if your <laughs> tax filing process is a bit complicated, then they might charge more. So yeah. And the next one is, we have to find an organization that can sponsor our status to keep the visa status. So, we have to ask one of the organizations to give the sales record or the capital amount to put for the application. So although uh, we are working for several organizations or companies, still the applicants needs to get a, a application form, two application forms from a company. So we have to get company, like the applications with company stamp from one of the organizations that you are working with. And please note that uh, freelancers or anybody needs to care about the minimum wage in Japan. So usually, I mean, basically in Tokyo, the minimum wage is 1,013 Japanese yen per hour. 
So if it's less than that, it's hard to survive here. So immigration bureau may need to reject the application because they need to like secure your status in Japan. So yeah, please make sure that we all get the minimum wage according to the contract term. Also, please note that uh, let's not say self-sponsored visa because this is not the legal term specified anywhere. So I know like practically we use it, but um, maybe sometimes immigration side or like some script nurse may not understand what's about this visa. So we just need to say that um, we need the visa by working as a freelancer. That's more accurate, I think. So the second one is solo operator. Basically, what solo operator needs is the same as the pure freelancers that I just explained, but there are several tax benefits for solo operators. So the first one is a 650,000 Japanese yen deduction from our income as long as we submit blue taxation form, Aoiro Shinkoku Shonin Shinseisho. So like as long as we submit these uh, documents to tax office, we can get this deduction. And also we all have a income deduction for certain amounts, but if we are sole operator and we file the tax, we file the tax via e-tax, uh, electronic tax system, then we can get 480,000 Japanese yen deduction on top of the six, 650,000 Japanese yen. So it's very like, good advantage for us. Also, another good thing is we can deduct expenses because some of the expenses are for our business. For example, if we buy some books for the business or if we need to go coffee meeting and if we get laptop or for work, then we can also deduct these expenses. So yeah, if you're focusing on your freelance work and thinking about some like ways to efficiently uh, think of your tax, then becoming sole proprietor is good. The third one is about startup. So how to start a startup as a freelancer. So as we discussed before, Shibuya government and a lot of startup cities in Japan provide startup visa. So uh, we can apply for startup visa. And if you have any questions about startup visa, we can help. So please contact us. And also there are great blogs so if you want us some research, uh, you can just like click and read and basically you know all the process of like starting a startup. Also, a business manager visa is not improbable to get. It's of course difficult, but um, it's basically uh, the like we have to submit all the documents that we provide for a startup visa. Plus, uh, we have to fill up, fulfill some criteria to apply for business manager visa. So mainly we need 5 million Japanese yen capital investment to the company. And we need a dedicated office space to get the business manager visa. Aside from these, uh, the applicants for business manager visa needs to have a company registry uh, documents and that we submit to the tax office and several documents we use for incorporation procedures. But uh, it's also possible to directly apply for business manager visa, but uh, we strongly recommend startup visa because startup visa doesn't require the dedicated office space. Also, we don't have to pay 5 million Japanese yen Yet we have it's better to have it, but like no need to invest everything to the company yet. So the last thing is about employees. So um, employees might could be uh, easiest way to get the longer status in Japan as an engineer. So um, also that depends on the category. So if we want a three to five years of residential status. Uh, maybe it's nicer to get hired by either category one company or category two. 
And so to distinguish what's which company is category two. So um, thinking about the like monthly salary for all the stuff and also the average salary for like all the like workers working in Japan. I would say if the company holds about 100 employees, they might be categorized as a category two. So it depends. So like we cannot guarantee everything, but yeah, if the company is like pretty big size, then they might be, they might fall under category two. Yeah. So I think as an employee, it's all about what we need to prioritize. So I think if it's category one, it's publicly listed company. So um, there might be some politics, lots of organizational um, like rules, but um, we can like have a secure job. Also, we can secure the status, which is great. And if it's category two, maybe like the company is growing bigger and bigger. So maybe we have less control on the management level, but of course, there, there should be a HL person or a legal person who can take care of your application. So it's very easy to take care of the visa application, I think. If it's category three, maybe we can join as a, uh, like founders, like we can join the founding team. And if it's category four, it just started. So it's chaos, but it's pretty fun. So <laughs> it's about, I think, what to prioritize. So this is all from my side. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Miho. Um, guys, so I encourage you to write your questions in the chat right now. Uh, before uh, that, I also have a couple of questions just to clarify with Miho. So thank you so much, Miho. Your, first of all, your presentation is like a, is a treasure book. So many useful things. Um, my first question would be, you mentioned uh, several types of their like, occupation that you, uh, the engineers can uh, take. So it's a it's a freelancer. It's a sole uh, proprietor. Is a what's the third one? Uh, let's see. Sole <laughs> 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 so proprietor freelancer. Then starting a startup, I think. Right. Um. So and uh, are all these people getting the same type of visa? Means working visa. Means we are talking about the uh, the name of this visa is engineer specialist in humanities international relations is it the only one type visa that these people get i would say so yeah uh, because like they are working as an engineer so their activity is under engineer visa so immigration usually uh like categorize the visa status according to the activities or status activities for example engineer the status is for example spouse or like yeah like kids for example so yeah, um, as long as you are doing engineer work, the visa you can get is Engineer Humanity International Service Visa. Right. Um, so for employees, it's also uh, the engineer visa as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Basically, yeah. If um, they're mm -hmm. yeah, in management level, it might be better for them to change to business manager visa in a certain extent. Right. Um, there are, I'm pretty sure that many people here in Japan are on the so-called highly skilled visa, right? Mm -hmm. um, do you think uh, engineers also are qualified for this type of visa? And can you, for example, become a sole proprietor with a highly skilled visa? Or can you start your startup with a, uh, this kind of visa? Uh, it's a good question. So highly skilled professional visa have three categories. One is academic. The second is usually the working permit. So it's almost the same as engineer humanity uh, international service visa. The third one is business manager visa. So um, so usually if all the engineer visa holders can have over 70 points, they can upgrade the visa status to highly skilled professional visa from the grant working permit. But uh, the we have to be careful that if they start uh, becoming a highly skilled professional under the company, then if if we quit the company, then the point calibration starts over all over the again. So, for example, 
like usually the reason why people need to get the highly skilled professional visa is because they can apply for permanent residency within three years for those having over 70 points and only one year for those having over 80 points. But uh, if they quit the company, then they have to start applying for highly skilled professional visa again. So <laughs> they have some commitment for that. And I don't think it's probable for solo, solo proprietor to directly go to the um, highly skilled. I've never heard of that case because um, like to get, because the solo proprietors are basically the same position as a business manager. So they have to fulfill the 70 points or 80 points as the business manager visa category under the highly skilled professional visa. But that requires a lot of like salary and like also lots of experience. So yeah, if any of your categories under that, I, I'm happy to help, but <laughs> might be difficult. Yeah, to <laughs> points, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so we have already a questions in the chat. Um, for a freelance solo appropriate visa, are there regulations regarding the salary, number of working hours of your sponsoring company? Mm, I wouldn't say so. So like based on the labor contract, maybe there might be some um, like restrictions because like you might overwork if you get a lot of pro like programs. So some companies uh, reject or refuse to work with freelancers sometimes because like they cannot control the working hours for you because you just like freely get the contract from the other organization. So yeah, it's all depending on the companies, but there is no time restriction or anything. Just, yeah, what we need to be careful is usually like if it's like spouse of uh, foreign nationals, there is a time restriction. For example, they can work up to 28 hours per week. So also like, I think students are in the same uh, situation. So in that case, uh, the working hours has to be under 28 hours per week. Thank you so much for the detailed answer, <laughs> Um Also about the freelance visa, how can you apply from freelance outside Japan? What kind of company can give you freelance visa? Mm, I think it's difficult, I would say, <laughs> especially because like you don't maybe have a like previous tax payment record because you're living abroad. So it's kind of hard to get sponsorship or like pass the immigration procedures at the beginning as a freelance visa. So like as long as you can, for example, get the, let's say two or three contract from two from a Japanese organization, only Japanese organization. And if you add up all the uh, payment, and if it's completely exceeding, for example, like 200,000 yen or 300,000 yen or even more, then um, if one of the organization can like write you the letter and also like write, provide you the financial information for the application form, then there might be some opportunity that you can get uh, uh, apply for engineer visa as the freelancer, but you need contract. <laughs> Thank you. Next question. If someone already has a different type of visa and switch carries to an engineer job, how difficult is it or how long is the process to change from one kind of visa to an engineer visa? Mm, I think that depends on like what kind of visa you had in the past so of course it's easier to renew or change to uh, change to engineer visa if we had a similar past in the past but um yeah if it's i don't know for example i don't know like if if you had a visa that doesn't require any income then it might be hard to like change to like engineer visa because it's harder to prove that you will secure the job as an engineer. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we have a long question from Yershan, but I will try to read it very fast. I have a question regarding paying taxes after changing a job. What if you have a work visa for five years, but after two, three years, you decide to leave this company and join a small startup? 
as a contractor. The visa status is the same and application for a contract change has already been submitted online to the Immigration Bureau. The main difference is the company size, working hours and all taxes should be handled by myself. Is it okay to keep paying all the insurance fees and taxes by myself and working only as a contractor, even if you have a full-time work visa? Okay. Uh, let's see. So the the visa status is not attached to the time. I would say it is attached to the activity. So it doesn't tie yourself to work as a free like full time employee or working as a like contractor. I would say. So um, like as long as you are not hired as an employee under the company, then you have to file tax by yourself. And I think like when the when the previous organization stopped um, paying you the salary as the employee, I think that was the time that you changed the um, like tax payment method for yourself as a freelancers. So I don't know. I hope I answered your questions. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, so there is a person who wants to change, who already has a working visa in Japan, already working in the company, and uh, the person wants to start a coding jugyo, so proprietor theme. Uh, I saw some basic documentation, but mostly it was translated from Japanese. Not sure how should I go ahead with this. Any guidance, please? Mm. So basically, you have to submit two A4 documents to tax agency, national tax agency and to start a solo proprietorship. But before doing that, please ask your employer whether you can actually do it or not, because it's very easy to find out whether you're starting it. So um, yeah, basically just submit two A4 papers to tax agency. And yeah, between the February, March, you have to file tax by yourself. That's it usually. Thank you, Miho. Um... Uh, is it possible to work in Japan knowing English and inside from that only a couple of words in Japanese? I received the interview opportunity last year to work in a company in Tokyo and that said to me Japanese speaking wasn't required. What do you think about it? Depends on the company, I think. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, you, practically, I think many companies are asking N2 level. But since like there are so many international founders and like employees now, so I don't think all the companies require everybody to have that language skill nowadays. I just want to add also from our side as at Levagon, we also help to place uh, our students after the graduation as well. Uh, we also help them to find a job as uh, engineers. And uh, so all of them are basically junior uh, developers. And, you know, it's kind of maybe harder to find a job for some of them. And of course, a lot of them are foreigners. So I want to tell you that it's completely possible to find a job uh, in Japan without knowing Japanese. A lot of our grade eights uh, don't know Japanese or can speak basic Japanese, but it doesn't matter if you work uh, in an international team or if you work in uh, for global startup here in Japan, it's completely fine and possible. Uh, cool. Okay. Um, maybe we probably have um, just probably let's take a couple of questions so maybe one question then we move to the base presentation and after that if we have time let's answer all the rest of the questions i hope that's okay um okay in my experience of getting a working visa in japan immigration can be strict about applicants having relevant qualifications from the university how do live a graduates without educational background in computer science secure the work um well not problem at all like all of our graduates i mean like majority of our graduates, they don't have a computer science degree and uh, they still secure a job as, a, as an engineer. I don't think that having a relevant qualification matters that much. Uh, of course, you need to um, submit your uh, diploma if you want to have a working visa. But if uh, you provide a necessary explanation in Japanese about why, for example, you have been studying uh, humanities at the university and why you start working as an engineer uh, it's completely fine you just need to explain this in the email uh, on the in the letter so what you started and how you qualified for this job right now um sorry Miho, it was not a question to you but to <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay um so that's an excuse i will just um 
find a question about, I think someone asked a question about the current situation with the visa. Ah, what's the visa process today? The state of emergency affected somehow? Yes, so like for those entering Japan from outside without having any visa status, uh, it's taking longer uh, because like immigration or any institution maybe pend the visa application, especially if it's certificate of eligibility. But if you're already residing in Japan, uh, everybody understand that we have to process it SAP because it's hard to go back and it's hard to return. So I think for those residing in Japan, I think Immigration Bureau process the paper quite faster compared to the last year, I think, last year or two years ago. Cool, thank you so much, guys. Uh, I know that we still have some questions in the chat. We will definitely answer them after Wei's presentation. Um, so let me welcome our second speaker at the stage, Wei, who has been working uh, on a working visa first in Tokyo, and then he recently switched to a startup visa. Uh, in a very short term. So, Bay, um, please go on stage and tell us about your experience. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you, Miho. Uh, great presentation. I also learned a lot from this different type of visa. I guess it's very, pretty confusing for everyone to, to kind of grasp what is going on with all this kind of visa option available as an engineer. I guess that's, uh, I'm one of them, and uh, I probably I can just show you my experience uh, switching from working visa to startup visa. So let me share my screen. Can you also my screen? Yeah, yeah. cool. Uh, nice. So uh, basically what I'm working on right now is I'm starting I'm starting a company called Mona in, in Tokyo, based in Tokyo. And I'm the CEO and the founder of, of the company. So I want to divide my presentation into two parts. The first part, I will talk about my experience of switching the visa. The second part, I will talk about what is the company about. So basically what is I'm working on right now. So for, for, let's start with the, from the first part. So basically a bit about my background. So I actually, I did my undergraduate a degree in UK, uh, not in Japan. So after that, I actually did one year Japanese language program at uh, uh, Vasa University, a uh, university in, in Tokyo. After that, I also I actually went to France to start to 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 start uh, to study business in a in a French school. Uh, so my actually my grad school in France, uh, they have a lot of like program with Japan. So I was I have been always interested in Japan. So I uh, kind of. Uh, using my chance to study in a French French school and then gradually moving my career path into Japan. So basically, I did one year gap year in Japan in a French bank, and then after uh, at the second year of my graduate my graduate school, I did an exchange program with University of Tokyo, and uh, so I was studying I was studying at University of Tokyo, and then I was kind of a start to started to to work part-time in a startup in Tokyo. So after I graduate from, uh, I went, after I finishing my, my exchange program, I just joined the startup. I, I worked during my exchange program. So after that year, uh, I worked at a startup uh, for about two years, less than two years. And uh, so until 2020, uh, December 2020, which is end of last year, so I then I quit the job. I had my idea. So I was looking for okay, I want to start my own business, and uh, I quit and I started work on, working on my own stuff. And then the problem came: is what kind of status I should have in order to stay in Japan to start a business in Japan. <laughs> so that is my big. That was my biggest problem uh, I was facing like a few months ago. So, uh, so switching from, uh, so I think that the startup journey started from when you have idea, right? So I had my idea of Mona uh, last summer, end of last summer. So I kind of, okay, I need to work on that. I, I will talk about the idea that what, what Mona is about later, but just let's focus on the, the, the process right now. So I had idea about last summer about Mona. So I, okay, it's a good idea, it's worth 
time to work on it. It hasn't been done before, so I had an idea. So I just start to talk to everyone around me. So talk to my colleague at the startup. Uh, actually, I found my co-founder uh, in, in my previous uh, startup. So I was working there and I talked to people around me. And uh, my co-founder, my current co-founder, she's also very interested in, the, in this project. So we just keep catching, uh, keep talking about the, the idea, and then she become became my uh, become my uh, my co-founder right now. So I think uh, if you want to start a, a business in in Japan, I think co-founder is kind of a big problem because you might know uh, a lot about engineering, a lot about coding, but you you can't do like sales right in Japan. It's the language barrier, the culture barrier. There are a lot of difficulties there. So you might interest into, uh, you might interest in finding some uh, a Japanese people can work with you on your on your idea, and I, I think from my experience, uh, my takeaway is really to to uh, maybe start by working in a startup because in that way actually you can meet people actually interested in starting a business. So if you work in a big corporation, uh, the chance of meeting someone who are willing to take the risk and start a business with you is actually quite less than the chance you found of co-founder in a, in a startup in Tokyo. Uh, so then you have uh, someone to, to work with and then the next step just build the prototype. So basically I started building the prototype uh, full time uh, January uh, this year. So from January, I spent three months uh, build uh, a mobile app. Uh, uh, so MVP, so we launched our, our app uh, last last month, April, mid April, so that is the prototype part. So, uh, so I was like, I had a visa, right? I had a working visa in a, a sponsored by my previous startup. So my visa gonna expire in end of April, by the end of April. So I was not worried that much about okay, I have a time to stay, and because of COVID, they actually the immigration office can extend your visa a bit more. So I read the news, but I haven't checked officially with the immigration bureau. Uh, so I was like, okay, I need to focus on prototype, just like get it, move, get, it, get it moving as quick as possible. So I didn't worry about the visa part. Then, <laughs> and actually they're like, I look at the, I look at two options actually. So uh, Shibuya actually in Tokyo launched this program uh, this, they announced they're gonna sponsor stop visa actually beginning of, of end of last year, so this uh, December 2020, but officially exactly when, actually I didn't know. And uh, because I'm not sure, so I was like, I took, I took two way actually, two way to, 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 to approach this problem. So one is to wait for Shibuya. The other is to actually to look for other options such as um, management visa and also the startup visas uh, by sponsored by Ibaraki Ken. So it is the prefecture next to Tokyo. It's not too far away from Tokyo. Uh, but uh, but there for the management visa part, the, the solution is not suitable for me because uh, I I'm still trying to look for the my product product market fit for my for my uh, for my startup. So it's not really the good phase actually to just okay invest five million yen into a corporate account and then uh, find the office. And in, in Japan also to find the office for startup is also quite difficult. So because you need, uh, uh, you need to, of course, incorporate, and then you need to actually pay a lot of money upfront before you can actually have the space. So it's, it's a really a significant cost for me to, to, to have that visa. So my, my only like solution left is startup visa either by Ibaraki Ken or Shibuya. So luckily when, when I was like talking to Ibaraki Ken, so because my, my actually my business does not fit Ibaraki Ken very well because it's a restaurant food uh, based uh, service. So Ibaraki Ken, a lot of restaurants there, but it's definitely not as, as many as, as rest, uh, the number of restaurants in Tokyo. So luckily, so Shibuya started the application for the start visa in April, uh, which is, in Japanese, this is really giddy giddy, basically, uh, really dangerous. I, I, I'm definitely, I do not recommend to, to follow my method, but uh, so I, uh, uh, Shibaku announced, okay, application started. So I just 
together my team and we start to prepare for the or, or to to prepare all the documents needed for, to to apply for the visa so we spend one week to actually fill the application form actually we we actually check with some like uh, uh, legal people so some legal advisor some consultant to to make sure the application form the uh, financial projection of the of the startup makes sense so uh, recommended by Miho Sang so we need to, uh, because when you have someone check your document application form like the, the legal and accounting person check your pa your paper is you have a higher uh, chance to to have the the, the startup visa uh, so I prepared that document and I had a few email exchange with Miho Sang. So Miho Sang actually gave me a lot of support during that process to also, okay, wait, you should do the application form this way, this way, this way. You should give more detail about uh, your your market size or whatever that just as an example. So uh, great help, great support from uh, Miho Sang. And uh, just like let you know, so in case you apply for the star visa, so Miho Sang reply email super fast. So, <laughs> so don't worry about like, if you have tight schedule, really helpful. You can't, you can't, you can't uh, expect more. So, uh, so, but still there's like a problem with my application form and, uh, uh, and in that time is already approaching mid, uh, mid April. So I have one week left to legally stay in Japan. <laughs> so very dangerous. Uh, so, okay, I need to call Miho Sang. So I actually uh, read an email to Miho Sang and uh, explained to her, okay, my visa gonna expire in less than, two, less than 10 days. So how should we do? Uh, Miho Sang, like she really kind and uh, okay, let's have a video call to see what's, how can we sort this thing out? And because our application form kind of finished, so we uh, we changed whatever Miho Sang asked me asked to change, and we submit the application just like one exactly one week before the, my 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 uh, my previous working visa expires. So Miho Sang, she's like super super amazingly, uh, get my application sent to everyone in Shibuya Ku, pushing everyone at Shibuya. Okay, look at the application and uh, reply to him like give him answer uh, as quick as possible so this is an amazing support so i got uh, so my uh, application form passed so i had an interview uh i had an interview organized by shibiaku and also the advisor from shibia uh shibia uh, star support so after the after the interview so i wait a few days and uh, then I luckily passed <laughs> after the interview, and um, uh, I was so worried because I was so worried about the, the, the result. Because if I failed, I, I don't know actually what to do actually. But me also actually kindly uh, assure, reassure me that if you fail this one, we can still have like two more options. So Miko san wrote me a long email explaining other options I could have. <laughs> so very great. So, so you, you can't expect. Uh, greater support from other than that. So, uh, luckily, I passed interview, and uh, Miho Sang emailed me at uh, six forty-four a.m. in the morning on Sunday. <laughs> I still remember the time, exact time of, of that email. And uh, great, I passed, and I, I just woke up, and uh, such a great, such, it was such a great Sunday, <laughs> I think, for the past two months uh, after busy preparing my my visa and etc. So that is my 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 story of of switching from uh, my working visa to star visa, with uh, the support from uh, Shibuya startup support. So but we don't recommend anyone to uh, submit the visa in such a short notice. Yes. you are really lucky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I get. I'm. I think I'm super lucky. Yeah, in this way. Yeah, yeah. Not recommended at all. Uh, yeah. Take your time and prepare and, uh, and etc. So uh, I think I'm gonna take the rest of time, bit five minutes, to to just briefly explain what I'm doing now. In case any of you interested in what I'm doing, so I'm gonna play a, a video. Can you present? Can you uh, click Oops. present for your presentation on the right top? Sure. So we can see it full screen. Thank you. Uh, I think the 
the English subtitle have in, uh, in, it's in Japanese, but it has English subtitle, but I guess it's pretty fast. So I'm gonna slow it down a little bit and it'll allow you to read the, the subtitle. You could also probably narrate. Yeah, it'd be too slow, I think, maybe. <laughs> no, no, I mean, you can probably explain by yourself as well um, while the video is playing what you're Oh, okay. About. Okay, sure. I think the audio is not playing. Audio is not playing. Yeah, yeah, we don't hear any audio. We don't hear any audio, so I would really appreciate if you could explain maybe in your own words what is yep. the, the app is about. Sure. Uh, then I don't then I don't do this. So basically we are doing right now is an app, uh, a mobile app that allow that solve a uh, very two basic uh, question from uh, so the problems facing by the travelers. I, I'm not sure how many of you have been to Japan. I traveled to Japan before. Uh, so I'm uh, based on the statistic from the uh, tourism agency of, of Japan. So actually most of, of uh, so they have a ranking of the most anticipated activity when you travel to Japan, for the, uh, when you travel to Japan, actually number one is food. So basically most of the international travelers coming to Japan, I'm aiming for the Japanese uh, food. So, but however, I'm also one of, of, of those food lovers. And for me, I, actually the, the question uh, I always have when I travel to Japan is uh, how to find like authentic local restaurants. So, so far all the solutions, all the existing uh, apps or solutions, they uh, you, for example, TripAdvisor, Google Map, You've, you've searched restaurants and you have a list of restaurants and you can find the stars of, the, of each restaurant. But all these stars actually, you don't know who gave the, those stars and you don't know actually the star is when. It's a, cum it's a, a cumulative process. For example, one restaurant can have five stars three years ago. Maybe they changed the shape or maybe they, their service kind of not good anymore. So you're still taking into account stars from three to five years ago. So stars, I think for me is really not trustworthy, and uh, and also uh, for for example, Tripadvisor, uh, a lot of the times is is really the buzz restaurant among uh, internet or among travelers. So it's, it's not the restaurant loved by locals. Uh, so how to find those authentic local restaurants has always been a big problem for me. So another problem is when you arrive at the Japanese restaurant. So how do you Older like a, like a local, so you have maybe you have English menu, but you have a list of dishes, but you never maybe never heard of. You, for example, you go to a sushi restaurant, you have different options, like so many options of sushi, but you don't know. Look, if a local or regular customer of a restaurant, if a local came come came to this restaurant, what would a local order? So in order to solve this problem, we we uh, came up with the idea of Mona. So basically we want to, we take the regular customer of the restaurant as the influencer for the restaurant. So we, we, we are a platform that allow, uh, we give, we allow the regular customer of a restaurant to, to add a restaurant into their collection. So for example, I'm, I have been living in Hongo area, so where I'm living now for about two years. And I have uh, my go-to restaurant, like restaurant I visit regularly every week. So I want to share those with like my go-to restaurant to, to, to others, to especially to the, to the travelers come to Japan for the first time. They don't know what local will go. So we allow, it, we, our, our app allow the local, uh, the local people to support their favorite restaurants. And the, another uh, big part is 
So there are a lot of like food influencers on the, on the internet. So how then can they monetize through, uh, through their content? So we actually want to, if an influencer, if a, if a, a local, if a, a local people uh, add a, a restaurant to one of their collections, and if they also share the way, that, what do they order in, the, in those, in their favorite restaurants, and we're gonna talk to the restaurant and connect them so the influencer can sell their favorite dishes on behalf of the restaurant and their friend, their followers, the travelers can order on our ad and the influencer can get a commission on each sale. So for, um, for the restaurant part, uh, so we are basically a cash list plus influencer marketing two-in-one solution at affordable price for restaurant owners because right now it's really a, a trend for in Japan for restaurants to adopt cashless payment system. And it's actually quite expensive to have like, for example, right now the popular PayPay, pay, right? So the PayPay pay you pay like, or you have a, a, a terminal for process visa, a card. So that actually is, and you also, you might use, for example, SNS marketing, you might use Tabelo Logo to, to get your customers. So this combined the cost of, of two system actually is a significant cost for, for a restaurant. Right now, so we want to combine the, the, the two system into one and of, of offer it at a for the price. So another part of a benefit for restaurants is really to have a insight, can visualize who are your important customers, who are your regular customers. So we want to help restaurants to build a deeper connection with the regular customers and help them to visualize actually your regular customers and produce other customers to become a new regular customer of your, your restaurant. Uh, so yeah, so basically for a bit, uh, a bit about my, my kind of incentive to create Mona is I don't, I think there are like a lot of chains, right, all over the world. But uh, if you travel to Japan, you don't want to actually visit a chain restaurant, right? That is not part of the everyday life of local people. Uh, I, I also felt one. So when I, my first time traveled to Japan, Tokyo, so I wanted to eat uh, Japanese yakiniku. And I, I searched on uh, Google map and uh, I have, I found a good restaurant, like good pictures with like uh, relative high scores. Uh, I went there with my friend, we were happy, but after living in Japan for three more years above, and I, I know that restaurant is a chain restaurant. It's not, it's not like a restaurant like loved by locals. So I saw the Mona we wanted to do is really a world where the craftsman uniqueness shines. So we really want to support those like small, but unique restaurants allowed by locals and to make them shine, uh, not only within their local area, but also like internationally, international travelers can find them as well. So thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, let me know. Well, thank you so much, Wei, for your presentation. Um, if you guys have any questions to Wei or Miho as well, feel free to ask in the chat. Uh, and we also had some, uh, we had a question from Slava. Um, what is the title term or conditions of the startup visa? Did you have to incorporate to get it? Can you also provide employee visas under it? And I think Miho is, uh, is here to answer that. Thank yeah. you. So yeah, <laughs> thank you for that question. So it's a uh, it's 12 months and yeah, um, you don't have to incorporate a business to apply for a startup visa. And, but um, for example, Weishan's case, it was different. So <laughs> it was, it is also possible to incorporate a company and apply for a startup visa because startup visa is basically for the period to preparing, prepare your like business manager visa status. So for example, even if you incorporate the company, um, you can, I mean, like you can start, for example, raise, start raising fund to fulfill the 5 million yen requirement to, for the business manager visa. So it is okay to incorporate, then also apply for a startup visa if that suits your business style. Oh, thank you so much, Miho. The question for Wei. Um, so it looks like your app is uh, invitation only, is it? Is there a way to get invited? Cherry is living in Japan. Uh, oh, sorry. 
So yes, we are right now invite, uh, invite only uh, system because uh, we want to like, right now it's COVID, we want to get actually the creator, basically those local people to share the restaurant. So we are mainly right now to curate contents for travelers to use. So if you live in Japan, if you have your go-to restaurant, we are more than happy to have you on, on, the, on the app. Uh, you can email me. Uh, I can send you my, my email so I can invite you to, to, to test the app. Thank you, Wei. Uh, well, the Miho is answering the next question. Could you please share probably your email or LinkedIn in the chat? Yeah, I'll share, I think the email, the, the YouTube link, the, the YouTube video also, I can share the link of the, the YouTube video and Thank also you. my email address. Thank you. We have a question from Matthew. Uh, so Matthew is working for a company in Japan and still with a working visa. And he would like to start his own business interested in the startup visa. And the question is, can I apply for the startup visa while still working at the current company? And in the case my startup application is accepted, is there is a timeline for when I should be quitting my current company to start officially and legally the business? Yeah. So yes, so you can start applying for a startup visa while working for the current company. But uh, one of the criteria for a startup visa is you have to really commit to your startup and you cannot do part-time job aside from the main startup activity. So basically if you like apply for a startup visa and if you really start the startup activities, you really need to like start doing the activities as a like startup founder no part-time job or no like side job. So yeah, also uh, the like, so you will like as play uh, like mentioned, there is a interview process with Shibuya City Office. And after the interview, if you pass it, you will have a proof letter from the mayor of Shibuya. And the, uh, the period of proof letter is three months after we issue. So within the three months, you have to apply for startup visa. So yeah, like you, it's the must, it's the requirement. So um, for your case, uh, what you can do is probably apply for a startup visa. And if you pass it within, within the three months, you, me, you will need to quit the current company and change your activity to completely start a visa within the next three months. Cool, thank you, Miho. Um, next question is to Wei from Daniel, uh, since you have talked about the importance of co-founders, would you say that's a good idea to study one semester abroad for networking purposes? If so, are there universities in Japan that support startups? I, I didn't understand your question. So you want to study abroad, like you, study, you want to study in Japan for a semester in order to find co-founder. Are right. you... This is a yeah. I think there's a question. Is yeah. In order to uh, find a co-founder, is it a good idea to study one semester abroad for networking purposes? It's really up to your like. I'm not sure. Like what kind of school? So what what kind of school you are talking about? So if you're talking about Lavagen or or other like this, uh, for example, the startup related school, maybe it's a good idea. But other than that, I, 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 I can't see the, the clear relationship between studying and finding a co-founder because the network, the, the circles of different people kind of quite distinct. So maybe you can, okay, you, you want to have a start student visa at, 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 in Japan, you need to come to Japan, and then you want to like kind of social around to, to find co-founders, maybe that work. But uh, it's such an interesting idea, but I haven't thought of that to study and to study to form the co-founders. Yeah. yeah, if you if you can, then do it. Yeah, uh, yeah. In case of uh, Levagon, definitely um, a lot of people join us in order to um, build an MVP, and then uh, during the process, some of them find their co-founders, or like some of them start a project together with their teammates. Uh, that's right. Uh, but Levagon is not university, so we don't offer like uh, a semester abroad program, something like that. But talking about the universities, I do know that a lot of universities in Japan, they support entrepreneurs. For example, the Kyoto University, they have uh, the Kyoto International Entrepreneurs Club, something like that. Uh, so they organized the hackathon already for the second year in a row. 
Um, definitely, the Tokyo University has a lot, and I'm pretty sure your alma mater, Vaseda, should definitely support entrepreneurs. Cool. Um, also, a question. Um, Okay, we have several questions. One more question is okay. For someone who might not need a startup visa, if you can, is it possible to receive other kinds of support from you in corporation, office search, bank account, and so on? Yes, so we can support. So yeah, no, not only restricted to startup visa holders. Yeah, we can support in corporation process. If we have question about hiring some people from abroad, we can guide you through the process. Um, thank you. Uh, can I study the master's or PhD on the work visa? Mm. <laughs> I've never heard of it. <laughs> Where's any tips? <laughs> uh, I, I think mm, this, the student visa, they have a, for student visa, they have a clear guideline of how many hours you can, you can work basically part-time. So if, if your main purpose is to work, then apply for the working visa. So if you want to do a PhD, then do a PhD visa, but you can also find a startup to work in part-time. I think it's up to 28 hours per week. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I've heard more <laughs> about the opposite situations. People who had a student visa, they tried to work as much as possible in order to um, cover their living fees and expenses. Uh, but if you have a working visa in Japan, means you, you really have to, you know, unless you are hourly rate is really high so you don't need to um you know work a lot in order to um you know have enough money to convince the immigration that you're here to work um cool and one cool question for way when you prepared your business plan how detailed it was and did you already present a working prototype of your app or simply just wireframes mockups were enough uh I highly, because I think during my application, I think one very important takeaway for me was don't treat it as a start visa, treat it as a preparation for your management visa. So if you seriously want to launch your business after this one year to prepare for your business, then do it. If not, if, I, I don't think, I'm not sure Miho Samka maybe can answer that a bit more, but I, I think you need to have a very detailed business plan uh, including financial projections of your uh, of with clear revenue model and your revenue projection for your business and uh, i'm not sure about i had a working prototype i have i built an app and i think that really helped the application so uh yeah i think i hope i hope i answered your question yeah just treat it as if it's just a cushion time for you to 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 migrate to to switch to your management visa after a year yeah, so we thought it was great. <laughs> we had like the like the beta version or like it wasn't only MVP, like he had the app. So it was great to see like how he was committed to his business for the past couple of months or even a year maybe. So yeah, so yeah, it was great to see it. And also like yeah, uh, many people are targeting Shibuya. So there are so many like passionate and successful entrepreneurs coming here and targeting startup visa here. So the level is getting higher and higher. So I don't like <laughs> pushing it too much, but it's like nice to have like the product so that you can also like, yeah, join the very say like high skill, like entrepreneurs, like communities here. So yeah, like, like also it depends on like your business plan and also business status. What we need to, like from the immigration perspective, what I really care is whether your business will be profitable within uh, two or three years uh, after you start getting the startup visa. Because um, like after startup visa, you have to change the business manager and you cannot renew the business manager visa if you have, uh, if the financial of your business is negative for two years in a row. So we have to make sure that you your business will be profitable in a certain time. So yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, so Matthew is asking, are there a lot of applications for startup visa in Shibuya currently? Yes. 
Uh, what's the lot? <laughs> Compared to the other cities, I think we are receiving a lot and we are revising a lot. <laughs> yeah, but it's yeah nice to yeah, prepare. It's the question as we can say for the business manager visa. So mm, impact delay of handle each applications. It's not happening right now. You can apply <laughs> pretty fast still. So. Yeah, so for people who are already inside Japan, it's very easy to change the status in the to the startup visa, like they did, right? It took him a very short time. For those who are based overseas, you might get your visa because uh, uh, the Shibuya city is issuing the, the letter of approval and uh, you can also have a certificate of eligibility and your embassy also can issue visa as well. But since the borders of Japan are closed, you just can't get inside. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, mm. you can already start some preparation if you seriously consider uh, coming to Japan and starting a business here. It's already a good time. Uh, those several months that it might take for Japan to open the border, you can spend this time preparing all the documentation and uh, clearing out all the uh, application procedure with Shibuya City. Cool. Awesome. Met you. Yeah. Uh, sorry. <laughs> also, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, uh, like Preparing for a startup visa application will not waste your time, I assume, as long as you're trying to get a business manager visa in the future, because at the end of the day, you will need that kind of information for your application. So it won't waste your time. So please, yeah, keep in mind about that. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, Matthew, Matthew, we are looking uh, to have you here in Shibuya. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Yes. Um, cool. Any last questions? I also got some private questions in the private asking about um, when Japan is going to open the border and something like that. And there's a question that unfortunately no one knows the answer here. <laughs> no, it's only government knows, I think. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, cool. And probably just a just a one question about Levagon. Someone is asking me, <laughs> is bootcamp remote? Uh, the Levagon bootcamps right now are uh, in a hybrid format. It means that if you're in Japan, if you're in Tokyo, you can study on campus. If you're remote, you can also study remote. Our platform is completely uh, equipped for that. Um, so if you don't need to come to Japan, uh, you can like, do it from the comfort of your coach. The most important is that the time difference is fine. So, you know, if it's if it's daytime bootcamp, we don't want you to um, stay at night. Um, and uh, is it necessary to know Japanese? No, it's not necessary to know Japanese. The, the, the classes and everything is in English. And it's also possible to find a job in Japan as an engineer without knowing Japanese. But of course, it will help. Cool. Do we have any other questions about um, the visa options? And also, I think that we shared his uh, context, but I think that Miho, it would be really amazing if you could share any ways that people can ask you about the startup visa. Yes. This is very important. Okay. Cool. Thank you everyone for asking us so many questions. It was really uh, cool to have you all and thank you our to amazing speakers for sharing their pieces of wisdom. <laughs> Thank you, Sasha, for Thank all you, Sasha, for amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Miho just shared uh, your email, guys. Please, um, the copy paste and feel free to send to just to send your questions or if you're already uh, ready to submit your applications as well to Miho, that would be amazing. And link it in as well. Yeah, cool. And we went slightly over the time, but it it was still worth it. So I'm super happy that uh, today's uh, event was super active. Um, I'm really grateful for people to asking so many questions. So yeah, that was it was really cool. Thank you so much, Miho and Wei. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you everyone. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Keep in touch. Um, feel free to connect to the speakers after the event. Also, feel free to look for this event recording after that on YouTube and keep in touch with Levagon events. 
Have a great evening for those who are based in Japan, in Asia, and those who are based in different time zones. Have a great afternoon and a great morning for someone in Colombia. <laughs> <laughs> we really, we really respect you, Colombian person. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Stephen, you're amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.